1886, as you can see, the first anode, ray, anode rays were analyzed or observed, rather, and they were called canostrolin. So basically, canal rays, um, and these are these are what typically are thought of as positive ions in a cathode ray tube. Then in 1913, J.J. Thompson, um, also known as the guy who found and discovered electrons, uh, one, which he won a Nobel Prize for, he discovered the ability to separate ions in a cathode ray tube based on their mass to charge ratios. And then in 1918, the first um, Arthur, Arthur J. Dempster, Dempster introduced the basically one of his first mass specs, which be, was the beginning of modern mass spec use and techniques. Um, and then in 1919, one of J.J. Thompson's students, Francis William Aston, developed a fully functional mass spec machine that allowed him to quantify over 200 elemental species. And he won the Nobel Prize two years later in 1921 for this, um, which is pretty impressive. In 1935, Dempster discovered uranium-235, which led directly into um, the Manhattan Project and Dempster and several of the, the big names in the mass spec field at the time worked on the Manhattan Project and used mass spec in the development of the atomic bombs. Um, the, so then in the skip a few years, few decades, there's, there's some developments that happen between 1935 and 85, but not as important or relevant for Saitoff directly. You could fill a whole couple pages um, with things on the timeline. So MALDI and other soft des desorption methods are invented in the 80s. In 1994, Mimuzu et al, who is cited in the Bandura paper we're reviewing today, a report the vaporization, atomization, of, and ionization of single cells using ICPMS. So that's quite important for what for Cytoff's applications. Then in the 1990s and 2000s, there's more more developments are made to kind of enable the detection of single cells labeled with different ions, which ultimately comes to 2009. Bandera at all in the group at Toronto report the use of Cytoff to analyze up to 20 markers, 20 markers in this case in AML samples. And they have been doing some work previously before this paper to kind of prove the principle. Um, this was kind of the main, main one that really put everything together and put Cytoff on the map. So briefly, just a quick theory behind Cytoff before we really dig in just for a high level overview. Um, the, so, so as most of you probably know, the cells are labeled with metal conjugated antibodies. They're then put through a nebulizer, aerosolized, and then injected into a plasma where they're atomized and ionized. And then they go through a series of filtration and focusing steps, and then are detected based on their time of flight, exported as unique spectra, and then transformed into FCS files. And we'll get into each of these components along the way. So just, just so for some background knowledge, and also please anyone interrupt at any time if, if I miss my misspeak or if you have a question or something is unclear, because it does get, it's going to get a little technical from here on, uh, but it's all from the, the viewpoint of where the cell is in the system. So, so Eric, just, just to a... give a high. Sorry. Just, a, just, a, just, just a, maybe a, a clarification, I guess, only because this question actually came up uh, during a, an intro presentation I gave yesterday, um, and they were like, "Well, you know, where where does the explain it to us the the mass and the cytometry part?" And I guess uh, how I had, um, explained it was that yeah, the mass is the, the metal tags and the single cell suspension that goes in where where it comes in the cytometry part of the technology. Because um, sometimes I feel. Um, and, and maybe the crowd here again, uh, I saw the attendance list right now, they're pretty well informed on uh, mass cytometry, but just in case somebody isn't very familiar with the technology, um, I guess, you know, the time of flight aspect uh, definitely deals more with the mass side of mass cytometry. Um, and definitely, yeah, it, uh, even me in the beginning days, it was quite, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it, like, help me understand how. And then, so thank you for going into this. It does, does help out. 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think your questions will be answered in the next few slides. Um, there's a couple key terms coming out that we'll cover before going real deep. So uh, just real back to these equations um, showing just the theory of time of flight. The if you think back to physics two and electronics and or electric fields and magnetic fields and moving particles, this is kind of where these equations come from. Uh, so your potential energy is equal to the charge times in the top left here. The potential energy is equal to the charge of the of the particle times the voltage that's applied to the particle or the voltage on the particle. Um, and then the kinetic energy of really any particle, this comes from Newtonian physics, is, uh, the, is one half mass times velocity squared, classic equation. Um, then when you have the way this system works is that the, the, all of the potential energy, you can think of it as actually being kinetic energy in the context of the system um, especially the mass analyzer, which we'll get into later, and how that works. So your potential energy is equal to your kinetic energy. And through that, you can substitute some of the known values. So your V, you know that's your distance over your time that you travel, time being the operative component here in this system. And then you can substitute, again, like I said, and what you end up with is that your time, which in this case is time of flight, is equal to some constant, which are set by the instrument parameters when you're tuning, times the square root of the mass to charge ratio. So from this, you can calculate based on the measurable quantities, such as the time of flight, um, and the known quantities, such as the coefficient and the charges that you'll have for each mass, you can calculate the mass to charge and thus separate your discrete isotopic peaks. So just some, some key terms before we go into it even further. Cytoff again, cytometry by time of flight. Uh, some of these might be a little more basic for some people in the group, but they're great introductory terms and it's important to be on the same page when talking about this stuff. Uh, the next is time of flight mass spec. So it's a method of detecting the ions based on the time a particle travels in known length or distance, like we just discussed. MS, mass spectrometry, spectrometry. ICP, inductively coupled plasma. So essentially that is a coil that, or a method of creating plasma using an induced uh, field, induced magnetic field, Focusing is an important term in this system, and it's usually a set of electrostatically uh, driven shaping and cooling systems of ion of the ion beams. So it's important for accurate detection and clean detection. Um, plasma, another very important component of Cytoff and all ICP mass specs, is it's the as we know the force state of matter and is generated from high frequency electric a high frequency electric field and the collisions that that creates in the argon gas that's inside the torch. The sample introduction is part of the system. As Zishan alluded to, there's kind of two parts of the system that we'll get into next. There's the sample introduction, which is a system of microfluidics and a pressurized tube, which helps bring the cells from the test tube that they're loaded in to the plasma to be ionized. Um, then the M, M over Z you might see a few times, or M over Q, it's called two, is it just the mass to charge ratio. And that's what's actually being identified in this system through its, the time of flight detection. So are there any questions or concerns about the keywords or the general theory before we jump in? All right, we'll continue then. So as again, as Zishan mentioned, there's two, two different kinds of components. So first is the more of the cytometry side of things is the sample from the sample introduction to the ionization. Um, so 
in A, you have your metal tag cells. They go through and get nebulized, so they become encapsulated in basically a water droplet and then they go on and are introduced into the plasma inside the torch. So we'll go from there. So this is, this is the current iteration again, Helios with the sample introduction system shown. This is the pneumatic sample introduction. Um, some people can use, do use auto sampler still, which you can. The PSI works pre generally pretty well. So how this works essentially is that your cells of interest, as you, as you all know or don't know, you stain your cells with whatever metal tagged antibodies you're interested in looking at, then you will have them in your single cell suspension and you load them on the sample introduction chamber here, which is then pressurized by argon gas, which forces the solution that your cells are in up through the sample line, which you actually can't see in these pictures, but it goes through the sample line and into the nebulizer, which generates the fine mist droplet that we saw previously, that the idea there is to encapsulate each single cell into a droplet, one droplet. Um, that is, that's, this is kind of part of why concentration is important when you're running your samples because if you have too high of concentration, you might get some droplets that are not just single cells and could end, end up causing you to have some doublets in your, in your sample. Less likely than another way of, of having con con concurrent events, excuse me, um, but can still happen that way. So next, after they're aerosolized, they are then inject, not injected, but they're, uh, seated, the nebulizer is seated in this spray chamber here, which is a cyclonic spray, heated spray of argon gas that helps to focus the aerosolized droplets coming from the nebulizer and kind of evaporates any residual water or liquid that you don't want going into your system. So from here, we now are entering the plasma. So this cell is encapsulated in water or CAS, if you're using CAS. Um, this cell is then injected into the plasma, which is generated by this radio frequency coil, um, which, is, which operates at close to 60 megahertz in the new iterations of, of the system. And essentially what happens is this coil has a, has a high frequency electromagnetic field that's generated between it through the moving of the, uh, the electrons through it, hence the inductively coupled plasma. The torch body seen in the middle is what actually is kind of holding the plasma, if you will. Um, so it has a gas inlet here and an injector pin here. The injector, will, when you ignite plasma, the plasma is ignited at the start of every day, so, or every time you turn the instrument on rather, and it's ignited through this inject ignition pin that causes the free electrons in the argon to jump essentially, and they, have, they are highly energized and start colliding with each other. And this collisions, these collisions produce very high energy plasma. So that's how you get your plasma. And the gas line here, the gas port here, helps to essentially cushion the plasma so that you don't have um, it escaping this kind of channel of where it, the plasma is contained. The plasma cone doesn't leak out. It can, if your gas flow here is inadequate, it can leak out and that can affect, that can severely affect your instrument and your data, obviously. Um, so, Cells come from the spray chamber, go through the injector, enter the plasma here, and now they are what's my mouse? They are now ionized and become no longer cells. So just a quick overview of the process I just described, but in a little bit of a different graphic. Um, 
the cells again are starting from the right over here. They go through the ICP torch from the injector and hit this plasma, which is this kind of shape here, um, which again is generated by this load coil seen by the circles on top and bottom. And the, the, all of the molecules and the atoms that made up your cells, that made up your antibody tags, that make up anything that might be within those droplets of water that we generated earlier from the aerosolization with the nebulizer are now atomized. So they're broken, all the molecules are atomized and broken down into their, sub, their uh, constituent atoms. Then those are ionized where they're, give, they're stripped of an electron and given a positive charge. So now you have this beam of ions coming through. And from here, essentially the whole system is designed to go from here to the actual detection stage. It shapes and kind of cools this ion beam for accurate de detection. So this, the, on the left here at the intersection of the plasma and the rest of the system is a series of three vacuum cones or three vacuum interfaces that are separated by three cones. Um, so first you have on the outside, this sampler cone, which basically if, if any of the ions or any of the plasma is not directly in line with the orifice here, they will go and be deflected to the out of the cone. That's part of the reason why the sampler cone can get so dirty in this instrument and needs cleaning fairly often because any residuals just hit that and kind of go to the side. Now these, these don't melt partially because they're made out of nickel, secondly because they're air cooled in the system so they are relatively stable um, devices. Then inside, after it passes the sampler cone, it goes into the skimmer reducer. So the actual Cytoff cones are a little different than what's in this diagram, but this does a pretty good job of showing kind of the filtering steps that happen in the cone interfaces. So the next stage is the, or the ion, the ion beam go, then goes through, through the sampler cone where it encounters a, there's a kind of an electric field there that, the, that shapes the ion beams into the next set of cones, which are the skimmer reducer cones. And these, these again, all three of these cones are kind of helping to shape the beam and focus it so that it can be better analyzed later. So just a quick look at what these cones look like. On the top is the sampler cone that is used in Cytoff, and the bottom is the skimmer reducer cone, which it looks like one cone, but it's actually an assembly of two cones stacked on top of each other. And again, these are what's actually shaping the ion beam at the initial position and then pushing it on into the, from the plasma to the internal parts of the system. Another important function that these cones, that these cones have is that they also take the ion beam from atmospheric pressure where the plasma is generated to a lower vacuum state where the ion optics and everything are located. Um, so those are at a lower vacuum than, than, the, than the external uh, atmospheric pressure. So just a bit of a roadmap here. Does anyone have any questions before we move on about the stage from about part one from cell to ions? So thank you for that. That's uh, yeah, that was uh, anybody asked next time, what does a cone look like? Or what, why do we need to clean it? There you go. It's, it's thank you for highlighting that. Yeah, yeah Eric, absolutely. this is great. Um, the one, um, one of the engineers told me that, you know, when I was trying to wrap my head around all this, what we're really doing is shooting like plasma donuts and trying to shoot our sample through that, which is kind of helpful for me to visualize exactly in this uh, very tiny, you know, cone orifice, but what it actually looks like there. But this was great, thanks. 
Yeah, absolutely. Just touching on the cleaning aspect, it is very important to keep these cones clean. If if the I'm pointing at my screen, like you can see it, but if the if any sort of buildup happens around the orifice of the cones, or these get damaged and dented or bent, then obviously the whole dynamics of getting the ion beam through this orifice changes as the shape changes and as it gets occluded. So it is very important. Hi, Eric. Thanks very much for, for this introduction part, the first part. So I kind of like have a quick question. So since you're talking about the three sets of different uh, cones and then the plasma stream hitting on the sampler cone, and then there, since mm -hmm. it's only very small holes opening in the center of the cone, so do we know like how how much samples or signals uh, are the ion cloud? If kind of like the ratio is passed uh, into into those cones. Right, that's a good question. I know there is some loss between um, obviously what actually is ionized and what makes it through the cone. I'm not 100% sure what that value is, uh, quite frankly. But yeah, that is a good point. There is definitely some signal loss from those steps. Okay. I can answer that question if you like. Oh, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, so um, the uh, atmospheric pressure plasma, and then there is a orifice of roughly 1.2 millimeters of the sampler and there is vacuum behind right mm -hmm. so the diameter from which the plasma is inhaled into this vacuum region is roughly eight millimeters so uh, basically uh, it is not quite correct that this is an ion boundary the plasma is quasi neutral and uh, it is just plasma it's a mixture of ionized species together with neutral uh, argon. So this gas plasma mixture is inhaled and eight millimeters diameter is the diameter from which it is inhaled into the first stage. So when the uh, ion cloud is formed from a cell, uh, it reaches roughly two millimeters in diameter by the time it reaches sampler through the diffusion. So basically it is fully inhaled into the first stage. There is no loss uh, when going from plasma through the sampler. The loss happens then, if you could show this picture with the barrel shock and the structure of a uh, supersonic jet. So here, the plasma actually is, uh, as we mentioned, quasi-neutral. So there is no ion beam per se yet. There is a uh, gas cloud and its uh, metals are fully ionized. So there is a single cell generated cloud which contains uh, metal tags which are fully ionized. And then here there is a shown the barrel shock wave boundary. Actually the uh, like the dotted line it's so-called mag disk. So through the sampler uh, the uh, uh, jet is formed uh, basically uh, it reaches 2.3 kilometers per second speed of argon there. And then the main loss, as you can see, is through the skimmer, which is also one millimeter, right? Mm -hmm. So there the, the loss is happening. So basically 100, about 1% 1 of this jet is sampled through the skimmer. That's the main loss. But from the plasma into the first uh, vacuum region, there is no loss because vacuum inhales up to eight millimeters area of the plasma. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Eric. Um, I um, Thanks for the introduction. I have a quick question about the, the possibility of forming um, doublet um, clouds. Um, did you mention that um, the density of the cells in the sample could uh, increase the chances of uh, getting doublets versus uh, singlet cells in that in that yeah, doublet. Yeah, definitely can. Yeah, definitely. So if you have two 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 cells or two cell droplets which become ion clouds next to each other, uh, very close next to each other, 
then they hit the ion or they become ionized and become ion clouds. And like Dimitri was just saying, they diffuse somewhat. So if they're too close together, they could end up diffusing so that the ion clouds become indistinguishable from one another. And that's, that's really how you get doublets in SciTalk. So is that something we need to optimize um, when we are preparing our samples or is that something that the, the, anybody who's working with the instrument directly that they, they can adjust um, um, the volume in a way that uh, we would reach at the optimal condition? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, it's really mostly dependent from what I've seen on the sample concentration. So just diluting that to roughly three to 500 events per second is going to give you the most resolvable events while also not running too slow. If you can run at 100 events per second, and you're going to probably likely encounter a very small percentage of doublets or, or any other kind of issues, but you're also going to be running for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So three to 500 events per second is really the sweet spot using the wide bore injector for having uh, pretty clean data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, if there's no more questions, we'll continue on to part two, which is really making sense of the ions that we've now generated. So now we've gone from being a cell to now we're, and it's, each cell is now an ion cloud after being skim, sampled and skimmed and is now in the system. So this is kind of, this is from figure one of the paper and it gives a, a good description, a uh, visual description of what really is going on inside the system. Um, to my understanding, it's still, it's pretty similar. Obviously some of the, some of the details about the specific tunings of the, some of these components are a little different between Cytoff 1 and Helios, but the general concept is still the same. So we'll move forward. Wait, first, so here is where we left off previously, our three gun interface. It goes through this deflector, which kind of turns, which turns the ions, the ionized particles 90 degrees and goes through an Einzel, Einzel lens, which is essentially just a focusing lens that uses electrostatic fields to focus the ion. Now, what is the ion beam? From there, the ions, the ions that are in the ion stream um, go through what's called a quadrupole, um, which really helps us to remove the ions that we don't really care to detect. Um, so these this quadrupole, also sometimes called high pass ion optics, um, essentially uses AC and DC currents in orthogonal um, fields, basically, to specifically filter out ions within the range of masses that you want to detect versus ones that you don't want to detect. The way it does that is it specifically tunes those fields to either be in resonance or non-resonance with the motion of the ions in the ion stream, as you can see here. So the non-resonant ions are kind of shot out of the system, if you will. If you think of this as like a centrifuge, um, anything that's low mass, like your carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, things that aren't in the range of the, of the detector are kind of launched out and gone and sent to the turbo molecular pump to be pumped out in the exhaust. And then what you end up with in this red stream is just the ions of choice that you actually want to look at. So in this case, that's between 75 to 
209 Daltons for Helios. So at the end of this, they're sent to the, they're sent to essentially it for analysis now. Um, so this is the actual, the time of flight analyzer. In this case, it's an orthogonal acceleration reflectron time of flight analyzer, which is quite a mouthful, but it's pretty simple um, to understand at least. So you have your ion beam entering into the system in 20, then you have, or you have your, then you have the ions being transported um, as each, as separate packets, if you will, or pushes they're called in Cytoff. And that's just kind of where event length comes from and the rain plot when you're looking at the instrument and running it. This is, this is what a push is, is every 13 microseconds, uh, basically a gate opens up, it takes a chunk of the ion stream. And this sample is then passed through this time of flight analyzer. So what happens is the gate opens, takes every 13 microseconds, takes a slice of the ion beam, then all the ions in, the, in that little section, that push, are accelerated orthogonally, so down through here to the reflectron, which reflects back all the ions into the detector. So think of this as kind of a mini trampoline, if you will, um, that basically each, each ion comes into this trampoline and they're obviously ions of multiple masses depending on what's in, the, in that push. So the masses of whatever heavier ions will obviously take longer to go into the reflectron and then reflect back out. The lighter mass ions will take less time. And so each, each mass of ion is then sent to the detector in or each group of ions that are of the same mass to charge ratio, depending on, again, how heavy they are, um, will be sent to the detector in discrete packets of time, time resolvable signals and samples. So essentially you have lighter ions arriving first and then your heavier ions following behind that. And the system is able to detect which those ions are based on that time that it takes to traverse from the, the reflectron to the detector. So the time of flight is the time of flight can be measured, and the length of the flight is known, and that's kind of how your mass to charge ratio is figured out from the equations we saw before. So, any questions, real quick, on the just on the time of flight analyzer itself? Because it's kind of a, I think it's an interesting concept. Um, but if not, we'll keep moving on. All right, we'll move on. So once the, once the ions have gone through the orthogonal accelerator and time of flight chamber, they then are sent to the detector, which is essentially a, um, it's, it's a detection system that is basically coated with electrons um, Kind of a, a metal metal it's made out of metal that is able to when it re receives an ion coming into it it will release electrons that then can go on and signal a cascade of electrons to be released and essentially what you have is this big cascade of electrons that can then be amplified and digitized and detected and kind of quantified how big that impulse is based on how many ions were initially hit onto the detector. So this is, this is the, really the critical component of the system in terms of what can take damage and what can, if, if a lot of damage occurs, can be rendered not usable. Um, the detector obviously is, is if, when you think about it in this way, if it's metal, 
basically a metal system that has electrons being shaved off of it every time an ion hits it, then there's only a finite number of electrons that can be used from that metal in the detector. So that's kind of why, that's why your detector runs down over time. That's why if you have a very contaminated sample or something with tons of free ions in it, those are all going to hit the detector and cause more and more electrons to be uh, shaved off and thus decrease your lifetime of your detector. Detection saturation, I don't know quite frankly too much about how that actually works in terms of just completely wiping the detector um, and making so that it's saturated with ions. Um, so if anyone else has any information on that, that would be great. So yeah, that's that's basically how the detector works. I can answer Following that, that if, if you want the detector search. Oh yeah, that that would thank you. Please. So um, actually, the depletion of electrons and and the dinos are metal oxide layer. So basically, uh, they have certain work function to generate uh, electrons. So uh, one mechanism of aging of the detectors is that through its lifetime, the surfaces of those uh, dynodes are coated with uh, impurities in the vacuum system. And uh, then those impurities, which are uh, hydrocarbons in general because of the oil used in the vacuum system, they can be by this electron current stitched to the surface of those uh, 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 dynodes and uh, that uh, changes the work function of the surface. So as a result, the yield of secondary electrons from each of the surfaces is deteriorating. And in order to increase it back, you need to apply more and more voltage. And as you know, there is a, a limit to what can be applied to the uh, detector. Uh, this is ETP detector, roughly shown on the right. So in terms of de depletion of electrons through the operation, uh, on the right, you can see those capacitors, the ceramic capacitors, which actually restore the charge on the uh, dynodes during operation. However, as you can see the, on the last dynode, it is a lot of electrons, right? So at some stage, there will be so many electrons there that this capacitor, which restores the charge before next uh, ion hits, it cannot restore the charge anymore because it's a limited capacitance. So that's how the detector is saturated. And there is a linear dynamic range of the detector, which usually is specified by the vendors. Awesome, thank you. I didn't know that's what the role of the capacitors, but that's very helpful. Thank you, Dimitri. So the last kind of step of the system here, um, and then we can open it up for questions, is the actual digitization and data output of the detected signals. So after detection, the signals that are generated from this the detector um, or that is hitting the detector rather, are digitized through two modes. One that's used to detect the sink mass to charge peaks in each push. And then the second mode uses an analog peak finding algorithm to kind of determine the peak intensity. And these are then analyzed and integrated together to give the dual count measurements for each sample, each ion going through. Um, so, and then again, the, this is kind of where the Gaussian parameters come from that are used in cleanup. Um, the total dual count data for one single event, so each peak for each, um, each metal, if you will, each isotope, is the, that data is summed together and smooth and then integrated and fit on a Gaussian curve, which provides the Gaussian parameters used in the cell discrimination. So as you can see on the left, it's fit to, it's compared against a perfectly normal curve 
which would be expected to be a single cell going through the instrument. Um, and then it's parameters accordingly are calculated, which gives a rough estimate of normality. And then once you get that, you have your, your biological insights, which data analysis is another story for another day, but the cells went from being single cells all the way through to getting becoming ion clouds and ions getting detected and then coming out as FCS files ultimately at the end. So are there any questions for about the system? We have Demetri here, so he's very knowledgeable about anything that either of us can answer anything. Any questions at all, please feel free to chime in. So I'm going to be selfish here, and I'm going to I'm going to ask Dimitri a question, uh, something that I haven't had a chance to ask actually, and maybe um, you know, unless, unless there's any other questions, but I'd, I'd love to just hear, you know, what about what brought about the um, the creation of of mass cytometry, Dimitri, from 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 your end, like what what was the uh, kind of gap that you saw within this arena that uh, brought that about? Um, maybe we should still give a chance for technical questions if if the audience ha has them yeah definitely i can call you to ask that question after <laughs> <laughs> i can That's answer it if, question. yes uh, well uh, i can answer it uh, if there are no other questions so first of all i would like to, to to comment that uh this work although i have my name as first author uh, we had a team of four. Uh, it's Olga Ornatsky, who is cell biologist, uh, Scott Tanner, and Vladimir Baranov, who are physical chemists. And my background is engineering physics. So uh, this work resulted from uh, our joint work. Uh, how it came about, we, Vladimir, myself, and Scott uh, worked at MDS SciEx uh, in the joint venture with Perkin Elmer. We were designing and developing inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometers. And we actually had 40% of the world market in ICPMS. Uh, and of course, ICPMS is primarily used for inorganic analysis, right? So basically, uh, if you want to detect metal with high sensitivity, this is state of the art method. You can detect it in the suspension or lately, uh, well, or also in solid by using uh, laser ablation to evaporate sample before introduction into ICP. And those are record detection limits, record dynamic range, uh, everything is uh, very good. Uh, and yeah, being at 40% of the world market, uh, the only way to grow is to find new markets. And of course, the biomedical field is uh, the one which uh, was very attractive, but how do you use ICPMS in biomedical field if you completely destroy your sample down to atomic ions, right? So the idea came about that why don't we label antibodies with metals? And uh, um, initially we did the work using ready available fluorescent labels, labeling kits, we, those labels were lanthanide enhanced. So they happened to have lanthanides in them already. Plus there was a nano gold available as well, the kits, right? So we could basically demonstrate, it was about 1999 or so, uh, that we could detect multiple proteins in a vial, ELISA-like assay, basically using four lanthanide enhanced fluorescent labels for different lanthanides. And that's when we applied for patents. And then the idea came about, okay, maybe we could do it in a single cell. But for that, the uh, conventional ICPMS is quadrupole based. So you described the quadrupole in your presentation. It allows one mass at a time, right? So by the time the uh, cell induced cloud is gone through the plasma, you could detect only one or two uh, ions. So it would not be multiplexed analysis because these transients generated by single cells are very short. So that meant that we had to develop a, a different analyzer, which would be either parallel. You could imagine that some of the mass specs 
which have magnetic sector design. And then they separate ions in space. And for that, you would need a like, long detector for multiple lines of ions there. And it still has to be fast to be ready to accept ions for the next transient event, right? And uh, those don't exist, fast uh, detectors for magnetic sectors. Uh, and uh, another way was time of flight. And on your timeline, um, yeah, I liked your timeline, but this period between 1935 and 19, was it uh, 80s? Uh, for MOLDI, uh, there was an important development when time of flight mass spectrometer was developed for the first time. Uh, and it was uh, uh, the seminal work was by Willie McLaren, who uh, developed uh, time of flight mass spec for Bendix Corporation around 1956. It was a commercial uh, system. Um, so it was a, a, a available technology for us, right? So basically time of flight existed. And in fact, there were already two ICP TOF MSs on the market at the time. And I participated in the development of it in Australia. This is GBC scientific company. So basically I worked there before coming to Canada. Um, and uh, we understood that Existing time of flight ICP MSs because they were measuring buckets of samples. Uh, they did not measure single cell events. They were not suitable. They were extracting 50 spectra per second, right? So obviously uh, you want multiple points per single cell event. And that's why you need 80 kilohertz uh, push out frequency. So we had to develop it, but uh, there was a big basis of already developed technologies behind our work. So it's not that we developed time of flight from scratch, right? So they were existing. And so that, that then we applied for patents while still being at SIEX uh, for single cell uh, uh, mass spectrometry based flow cytometer, if you like. And um, yeah, then things changed uh, with SIEX priorities and we didn't want to drop the idea. So we departed and formed our own company which is called DVS Sciences, and now it is Flodem Canada. So the uh, incentive position was that ICPMS needed to look for new markets. And obviously, the non-overlapping character of non-fluorescent mass-based signals was the main attraction. And that's how it started. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. I just have a question. Um, for like compared to the uh, traditional ICP MS, um, the site of um, how sensitive is compared to those two instruments? I know ICP MS is kind of like you can detect the PPB level, uh, but for the site of is uh, like for the metal tag, like how many ions is the cutting? It's a cutting line that we can show a signal for our protein probe. Okay, so we are talking about detection limits of roughly, uh, uh, depends on how you define detection limits, right? So the transmission factors are of the order of uh, uh, five to 10 to minus four, uh, close to 10 to minus three. So you can calculate that if you have 100 atoms per antibody, and that's on average the, your labeling efficiency, then basically you, you need at least 100 of those just to see the signal, right? Yeah. So 100 yeah. copies is sort of the ballpark. Uh, and answering first part of your question, uh, depends on which IC, uh, ICP MS, right? Compared to quadrupoles, we are probably three to five times more sensitive with Saito. Uh, the uh, record uh, system is uh, the, the um, element two, which is magnetic sector or new instruments, also magnetic sector. They apply 10 kilovolt voltages in the analyzers, which allows them to extract ions from plasma very efficiently. So those are probably three to five times more sensitive than Cyto, but then they cannot do single cell. Gotcha. Thank you. 
I have another question for you, Dimitri, if no one else has questions, if you don't mind. I, I was just thinking if you could, obviously there's been quite a few changes from the first iteration to where it's at today. If you could redesign Saitoff kind of from scratch, what, what would you change from your initial design um, or what might you think would provide for a different trajectory, perhaps? If I tell you, I, I will have to, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but seriously, you mentioned that uh, behind the uh, interface, uh, it is similar in design and that's it. The, the heart or the engine remains the same, including the three cone interface, right? So there is an, not much difference there. And um, one uh, clue I could give you is that compared to ICPMS, why we could be more sensitive than quadrupoles or standard ICPMS? Because we were tailoring to the mass range where we know the tags are expected, right? Who cares about lithium? Who cares about sodium, right? So that's why we were able to design the optics optimally for higher mass ions transmission. And in this sense, uh, behind the sampler, I don't see much to change. Um, and we already introduced changes to the sample interaction system. So uh, I think that it is still challenging to uh, A, have more than as you said, 500 or 1000 events per second, because this is defined by physics and I cannot do much about this, unfortunately. Diffusion is there. It's 5,500 degrees uh, gas kinetic temperature. You cannot prevent diffusion in such high, such high temperature environment. So the ion clouds formed from single cell will have finite size. So I cannot go much faster. And uh, what I would like to see and this is something which uh, maybe someone else is working on is to go beyond 50, 55% of cell transmission efficiency, which is probably uh, something which uh, not ideal. It's not too bad, right? Compared to what's in the paper, it was 6% uh, because we had very peculiar arrangement for this aerosol splitter where we took only part of the aerosol. Uh, but still, it is not 100%, and that's something which I would like to see improved. Uh, I wouldn't claim that I know exactly how to do that. What part is the biggest contribution to that efficiency loss? Is it the introduction system or that cone interface? Uh, no, no. The interface, as I said, it inhales completely the uh, cell-generated ion cloud, so there are no losses in the interface. It's before interface and cell stickiness to the tubes, for example, then the aerosol formation itself. So there are a few processes there. And as you understand, if you have uh, uh, five 90% efficient processes, right? It's 0.9 to the power of five. And you straight away at your half. So even if every process is quite efficient because they are sequential, then you, you have your losses. Very, very fair. Yeah, if I could just butt in a little bit. So, um, you know, since this paper come out and Dimitri, thank you so much for giving this insight. You know, we are on our third version of the mass cytometer instruments, right? And so with that, Fluidime has developed that we can detect more channels, kind of tighten up with the abundance sensitivity, for example. So that's important to highlight here that the what Eric is highlighting is, a, of course, our Helio system, which a lot of the people on the call are from, you know, the Boston Metro uh, Zeeshan and I's territory. So, um, you know, Dana Farber with NOAA and Zhao at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, these are these are Helio systems. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You mentioned abundance sensitivity. That's the difference between Cytof 1 and Cytof uh, 2 and Helios optics, that abundance sensitivity was tightened up. Yes, I forgot about this. Thank you. 